Welcome to the Why on Earth Community's Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series. Today, we are visiting with David Bronner. Hey, David. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Really excited about our conversation today. Right, right on. Thank you. So David Bronner is CEO or Cosmic Engagement Officer of Dr. Bronner's the top-selling brand of natural soaps in North America and producer of a range of organic body care and food products. He is a grandson of company founder Emmanuel Bronner and a fifth-generation soap maker. Under David and his brother Michael's leadership, the brand has grown from $4 million in sales in 1998 to over $122 million in annual revenue in 2018. David was born in Los Angeles, California in 1973 and earned an undergraduate degree in biology from Harvard University. David and Michael established Dr. Bronner's as a sustainable leader in the natural products industry by becoming one of the first body care brands to formulate with hemp seed oil in 1999 and to certify its soaps, lotions, bombs, and other personal care products under the USDA National Organic Program in 2003. Both actions resulted in high-profile litigation with government agencies, DEA, and USDA respectively that Dr. Bronner's ultimately won, cementing Dr. Bronner's activist orientation in the natural products marketplace. Over the years, David and Dr. Bronner's have been key leaders in fights for GMO labeling, industrial hemp farming in the United States, high bar organic and fair trade standards, cannabis reform, and a fair minimum wage. Today, David is helping to lead the effort to establish the Regenerative Organic Certified Standard, dedicating time and resources to creating an integrated comprehensive program that addresses soil health, animal welfare, and fair labor practices to advance sustainable and ecological alternatives to industrial agriculture. Uh, Dr. Bronner's partners with certified fair trade projects to source all major ingredients, including olive oil from Palestine and Israel, coconut oil from Sri Lanka, peppermint oil from India, and sustainable palm oil from Ghana. So David, it is such a joy to have this opportunity to visit with you. And clearly, uh, Dr. Bronner's has become one of the global leaders in developing sustainable and regenerative supply chains throughout the world. And I, I was thinking as a way to dive in, we might just start by uh, asking you, why, why bother with all of this? What, what is it that's motivating you? Clearly, you could have taken Dr. Bronner's in a number of different directions. <clears throat> yeah, right on. Well, I guess we got to start with my granddad, um, uh, Dr. Bronner. Um, uh, you know, his source passion was, uh, uh, well, he himself was a third generation German Jew soap maker. Uh, his granddad, uh, was named Emanuel, <clears throat> first began soap manufacture in 1858 in a small southern German town of Alpine. Um, my granddad came of age in the uh, in kind of early part of last century, um, and he came up, and by the time in, in the 20s, when he was apprenticed to another soap making uh, family, his, his dad and two of them were running the family operation. We had a really big factory in Heilbronn another southern German town, um, pretty much one of the biggest soap makers in Germany. And um, my granddad had, a, you know, he basically got a ma the equivalent of a master, so, uh, a, ma a master in chemistry, a master soap maker, and um, joined the family enterprise. <clears throat> but early on was pretty um, activist. He was very Zionist um, and political. And uh, his dad and, and uncles were kind of like, you know, like, please don't rock the boat, you know. It's, it wasn't Nazism and then fascism, like the eventual dimensions were not apparent in the late 20s, uh, but it was just still, you know, just a, uh, a time of unrest. And, and just, uh, I, you know, my granddad had a lot of ideas on things, so making it just repeatedly clashing with his dad and uncles. And uh, just, he came over at the age of 21 in 1929 and, and landed in the Chicago, Milwaukee area and became a consultant of the U.S. soap industry like P&Gs of the world and helped design factories and launch products. And uh, I met his wife and married and, and um, uh, had three children. 
by in the 30s. Um, and over the course of this time, he became increasingly desperate with the rise of Hitler to get his family out. And his two sisters got out. One uh, ended up in a kibbutz in Israel, uh, Lottie, and, and Louisa, uh, his middle sister, uh, came over to the States. And she got out in 38, right before the borders were closed. But his parents, like a lot of bourgeois Jews, thought they were going to ride out the madness. And, uh, um, and unfortunately, the, the factories were in 1940, and they were deported and killed shortly after. Um, also in this time, his wife, uh, Paula, um, my dad's mom, um, died when my dad was two, like she was sickly. And, and so my granddad was just dealing with immense tragedy. And, you know, somehow in the midst of this, he was having these mystical experiences of the oneness and the love at the heart of reality. And, you know, clearly saw that all the faith traditions were, were at their heart pointing at this transcendent mystery of love that even in a world of suffering and absurdity and, and, and tragedy that if, if humanity could realize our, our transcendent unity and that we're all children of the same divine source, um, then and in, you know, embrace across religious and ethnic divides that, uh, that we could avert uh, a nuclear catastrophe, which he saw as the next Holocaust. And if we didn't figure this out, we were gonna just all perish. So he went forth around the country lecturing on his peace plan, we called the Moral ABC. Um, and he was an early ecological pioneer. He early on saw, like, as industry in the post World War II era uh, moved increasingly to a petrochemical basis and pesticides and to set synthetic fertilizers and everything coming out of the war effort. We're starting to be applied to our food crops and, and personal care. Uh, you know, natural soaps were out of vogue. It became petro petrochemical based surfactants for, for shampoo and body care. And, he early on saw the problem of, of making this move and, and the damage to the environment. So, um, you know, he stayed true to what was be, uh, be, had become kind of an old fashioned uh, soap recipes of his family. Um, and as he went around the, the country lecturing, um, he would sell the soap on the side. And word got out that this was pretty dang good soap. And people were coming to get the soap without necessarily sticking around to hear what he had to say. So he began to download what he had to say on them that's on, on our label. So, so our label now has the moral ABC, like 3,000 words on each board, just kind of downloading his vision of peace and unity and love, and kind of the one love, the one true religion of love at the heart of all the faith traditions. And, you know, seeing that, you know, when you don't make fundamentalist beliefs and relate in a fluid way, that it all opens to that same, same mysterious love that's just way beyond any of us. And um, so with, uh, with the rise of uh, the counterculture and, and, you know, the recognition and rejection of corporate America and the war machine and the era of Silent Spring and, and you know, all of the, you know, the, the, the growing uh, understanding of the damage and the, and the, and the ecological catastrophe we were inflicting on the environment through our industries and agricultural practices and industrial agriculture in particular being such a massive harm to the earth. Um, so with the rise of the counterculture, they really embraced the soap that was like concentrated and versatile and biodegradable. You could wash your hair, your, your, your kid, your dog, your dishes by the spot of the river and not worry about it. So uh, it became really, you know, became the iconic soap of the era. And, uh, but he always, you know, he always um, kind of saw the, you know, as the business grew, I mean, for him, it was a nonprofit religious organization. It was not, I mean, it was the, the business very much was there to serve the all one vision. And um, eventually, the IR, he, he lost to the IRS uh, in the late 80s and disagreed with his tax exempt status. And we were forced into bankruptcy. And, um, and uh, my dad, who actually came, he had his own business. I actually grew up working in my dad's business. Uh, my dad was, uh, oversaw the soap production up in LA. He didn't, my granddad moved down here to San Diego, North County, San Diego, uh, in the early 60s. But, so I grew up in LA. My dad oversaw basically a large chemical manufacturing operation and oversaw the production of the soaps. He also developed things like firefighting foam for forests and structure fires. And I grew up selling firefighters and using foam uh, for my dad to follow my dad around, which is now standard on, on most fire trucks, like a compressed air foam system for uh, structure and forest fires. But um, so my dad and mom and my uncle basically came, my, my granddad got Parkinson's. And so my, my granddad basically retired and you know, my dad and 
Um, mom and uncle uh, you know, kind of right of the ship, fired a lot of bad advisors that we might have had a terrible advice. And right of the ship, and we exited bankruptcy as a for profit. But we always had that nonprofit DNA at the heart of what we we're about. So, um, you know, fast forward, I guess, to my granddad. Um, you know, I, I went through a lot after college. I graduated in 95 and went to Amsterdam and had some really mega psychedelic experiences. It really opened me up, just kind of uh, died into the light and love at the heart of reality and realized that what had really been selling, sailing over my head from my granddad pretty much my whole life all of a sudden made perfect sense. So I was like, wow, you know, he's been on it. He's been talking about this this whole time. And, you know, growing up, it was a lot. You know, it's like, we must unite this spaceship Earth. You know, it was just a, just a lot to deal with. But now all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, it was like so on, so on point. And also this was a time of like just recognizing the disaster of Western civilization and consumption, like just the, the alienation from nature and the insecurity we feel in a deep way that we compensate with like material consumption and um, domination and just the way we're just shredding and treating na nature as just like resource to extract stuff to make stuff. And, uh, you know, just seeing that the damage we're, we're you know, all these ec ecological systems systems in, in, in collapse and communities being shredded around the world and I adopted a vegan diet at that at that time as well and I came back and it took a little bit for me to join up with a family company and when I was a mental health counselor for a bit but eventually decided I wanted to uh, um, my uh, uh, ex-wife Chris um, uh, amazing woman who's now running a portion of our found, family foundation focused on trafficking and refugee issues um, we were uh, she got pregnant and uh, you know, I had to start really thinking about the long term, and and I had gotten to the point where I I want I was ready to work with my dad. You know, that was one of the things after college. Was the one thing I knew is I did not want to work in a family company. But you know, as I matured and realized, wow, if a company like Dr. Barnes were to offer me a job, I'd go for it in a second. So I let my dad know that. Um, and and my our daughter was born on March seventh, ninety seven, the same day that Dr. Barnes died. So they're kind of high fiving in and out. And shortly after, my dad was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and given, given six months. And fortunately, I made that decision to already come into the family business. And we had an amazing year together. We really downloaded the ropes and uh, kind of set me up for success. But um, when, when I came in, it was like very much vowing that. The things we did is put in a five to one compensation cap. So no matter how big the business got, no executive would make more than five times the lowest paid warehouse position. So, but you know, just early on, you can just see how things were going and just the way, you know, just so many people just started buying yachts and bigger houses and faster cars. And, you know, like we were just like, no, this is not going to happen here. And we're going to run this in a, in a way that liberates more and more profits to help drive our, our partner projects. And, um, you know, and as I came into the industry, I mean, one of the first things we did was, was incorporate hemp seed oil into the uh, liquid soaps. And hemp seed oil is really high in omega-3, um, which is a triple and saturated, triple double bond fatty acid that's essential for healthy heart and mind function. Um, but it, on a, in, a, in a cosmetic product is very smooth. We made our lather well, it grows like a weed. You don't need a lot of pesticides and fertilizers to grow it uh, versus things like cotton. It takes a huge amount of herbicide. Um, but then it's also positioned uh, in the drug war, just really showing the absurdity and hysteria of a drug war. So out of control, it was scheduling a non-drug agricultural crop as a schedule one substance. It was a, a way for us to kind of engage on that and just start to like you know shift the the laws in this country and start uh, having a much more rational drug policy. Um, and now you know we had a lot of adventures. We were fighting the DEA uh, a lot, but you know in 2018 um, we with the farm bill we finally fully legalized hemp farming uh, in the. Sustainable agriculture 
not, you know, I mean, back when I was like, oh yeah, this is a solution to everything. But, you know, over time, I, you know, just meeting brands like Waikiki, the Yerba Mate brand, it's vertically integrated and uh, all their, all their Yerba Mate is produced in, you know, in, in the rainforest by the Waikiki tribe in a totally sustainable way. And they go to market in partnership with their suppliers and they're not pitting farming communities around the world against each other and that equal exchange and other fair trade companies. You know, we were, or I was inspired to, you know, just realize like, wow, you know, I have no idea where our coconut oil is coming from. I mean, we're buying from brokers like everybody else on price and spec with no visibility to the growing conditions, social conditions, and environmental conditions. So in realizing that whatever coolness we're doing here in headquarters, where we're manufacturing the soap, we have 10 times more impact in our supply chains, in our agricultural supply chains. There's just so much more people, farmers, workers involved, so much more land involved. So what we're doing in our supply chains matters in a way a lot more than what we're doing here. Not that we shouldn't be taking care of our own house, but really taking care of your, or taking responsibility for your supply chains is, is crucial. And we realize that, you know, the first thing we needed to do was go organic, you know, like just realizing the disaster of conventional industrial agriculture and, you know, just all the synthetic fertility and, and pesticides and you know, poisoning of farm workers and the farmers and the ecosystems and that, you know, we needed to farm that in a way that replicates nature. You know, you look at a forest, there's no chemical inputs. It's all self-regenerating. You know, how, how does our farming ecosystem replicate that? So, you know, went on a big, long adventure figuring that out and then also realizing that organic doesn't in and of itself address the social conditions. There's no, you know, generally it's better, but sometimes not. And you really need a fair trade, some kind of certifying body to just make sure that, you know, farmers, well, we can make sure the prices are being paid right, but just make sure the workers are, that's translating to the workers and, and all that. So we were dual certified organic and fair trade, but a big part of the fair trade really was just in promoting best regenerative organic practices. Like how do you boost yields with compost and, and mulching? And, and uh, you know, over time we just like really got good at figuring out, and most of our agricultural supply, uh, our raw materials are, are from perennial tree crops. So coconut, palm, olive. And so, you know, what, what is the best uh, agricultural regenerative approach? And realizing that it's really about intercropping, you know, in an annual system, it's about a smart rotation, you know, maybe a seven year rotation and certain things follow certain crops and you know, you're making sure you're, you're, you're sequestering nitri nitrogen, the head of heavy nitrogen f feeders and, you know, not overtilling soil and all that. But in a perennial system, it's, it's more about intercropping complementary species. Like if you look at a forest, you've got tall trees, mid-level trees, bushes and ground cover. Um, and, and when you look at a cropping system, so if you can take, for example, in Ghana or palm, you know, palm is such a destructive crop. So, you know, hemp is a symbol of all that's good and palm is a symbol of all that's bad. You know, it's generally grown in this horrible way that these corporate plantations are ripping up rainforest and destroying a rain habitat, communities being shredded, wet, wetlands, uh, just, you know, all this carbon in, in the wetland is, uh, just evap uh, oxidizing the atmosphere. Um, but there's nothing inherent about palm that's bad. And it's just the management system. And if you take a regenerative management approach, it's actually a really great crop because it's very efficient at producing oil. And what we're doing is we're, we're working with smallholders in Ghana and, uh, and they're intercropping with cocoa, uh, banana, and cassava. And that's basically replicating. You get the tall palm trees, you get the mid-level cocoa and banana, and then the ground cover is cassava. And if you were to take the same area and do monoculture blocks of each of those versus like a, a smart dynamic interplanting, where you, you, you understand that how the cannabis are gonna fill in, you're doing a lot of pruning, uh, you're gonna double the yields. You'll have double the bio, biomass, double the yields, you're sequestering a whole lot more carbon, and you're producing so much more, and you're, you're generating a whole lot more income for your farmers. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's, you know, basically, you know, we, we do leverage our profits externally for a lot of other causes, but we feel like, you know, first and most important is really just making sure that, you know, our headquarters and then and our staff here and then all of the farmers and workers involved in our supply chains are taken care of and that, you know, if everybody did that, that we would start to really, you know, solve like some of the huge 
problems, you know, climate change and ecological catastrophe generally, if, you know, if businesses and then as consumers take responsibility for making correct choices and, you know, that by analogy as a, you know, and I've come to see myself in solidarity with high animal welfare, pasture-based, livestock, ranches, grass-fed, you know, it's all about eating less and better meat and making those choices and, you know, or plant-based diet as I've chosen. But looking at your plate as a farm and your, and your fork as a pitchfork and your knife as a butchery knife, and, you know, what does your farm look like? What does your section of the garden look like? Are you supporting, you know, a farmer who can really take care of their land and their people and their animals? And, you know, and it just looks amazing or, or does it look like a monoculture desert disaster? And that's, you know, and that's as that consciousness pervades, like we can really terraform the earth, right? I mean, if everybody starts choosing this, you know, one third of the earth's surface is under farm and rangeland management. And, you know, rather than some high tech, you know, solution, all we need to do is just really just choose regenerative organic and just start to really shift and make our farming ecosystems, you know, just revitalize rural economies, make, make, make friendly habitat for wildlife, you know, just take care of the farmers and workers. And uh, yeah, make heaven on earth, uh, uh, along with decarbonizing the economy. We got to do that too. Yeah, well, it's absolutely beautiful, David. And uh, boy, there, there's so much that uh, that you're sharing with us, and I really appreciate it. And I I want to circle back to one of your earlier comments uh, regarding your grandfather, and it, it's making me think when my uh, grandpa was um, still alive, he gardened. Uh, voracious he was an organic gardener and uh, you know he was a prisoner of war in world war ii he was on the black barge and just barely survived uh, that experience and yeah. afterward he had such a grounded and simple spiritual approach to life and he understood that good soil and good clean quality food was essential and i remember as a kid uh, talking with him about that and as i grew up recognizing that this industrial chemical-based agriculture was was insanity, was madness. He was one in the family who said, you're absolutely right. And he had a perspective that um, helped me uh, understand that what had been normalized over the last several decades was actually a massive aberration. And, and to use your uh, key word here, um, it was a disaster and is a disaster. And I'm, I'm so struck by your influence from your grandpa. And I'm just curious if you might share with us before we dive into some of the other technical stuff with regenerative ag and so on, if you might just share, you know, one or two of your fondest memories from when you were a kid with your grandpa that might help share his persona with, with our audience. Yeah. Uh, you know, my granddad was, you know, he was, uh, he was just coming from the mountaintop all the time. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, it was really important to him that his grandkids, you know, really grokked and downloaded the, the more ABC. And, and, you know, he, he went blind in the late 60s. Um, he, uh, he attributed that to shock treatment he received when he was kind of forcibly interned in a mental hospital in that kind of McCarthy era. You know, he was out there, like, talking peace and unity and love and like, got on the authorities' radar. You know, and he escaped, but he and, and, and went on his mission. But always, you know, always blame that uh, for his failing sight. But like we like to say, like our labels were designed by blind men. I, I don't think he understood just how busy things were getting. And, and uh, so, you know, but he, you know, we were supposed to memorize the labels, you know. And we come in, he's like, "What's the thirteenth? You know, and, and I'm like, "Oh man, but luckily he was blind, so I can you know pick up the label and like." You know, and that kind of blows my mind. Like, just hit him. Wow, very good, very good. You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So and and yeah, you know, just um, you know, just so relentless and passionate about uh, you know about his all one unity and just on it, just nonstop. Yeah, but, yeah. Those those labels are so iconic, and my mom wanted me to be sure to mention that she loves giving bottles of the soap to her girlfriends as gifts. And, and she loves that they're so natural and so versatile. And of course, seeing the bottles, it brings me back to some of my earliest memories running permaculture workshops a couple decades ago down in New Mexico. And, you know, it's now easy to find the bottles in places, you know, some of the big box retailers, of course, 
but you know, 20, 25 years ago, they, they were niche. It was not so easy to find them. And what a, what a tremendous story. And I'm sure there are a bunch of us listening to this discussion who have uh, personal experiences of reading all of those beautiful messages on the bottles while uh, showering or on the toilet or whatever. Well, right out, man. That's it. That's his, that part of his genius to realize, you know, like putting a message on the bottle, you forget a magazine in, in the bathroom and he's got you. Yeah. You're going to, you know, he's going to download his, what he's got going on. And that was, yeah, in the, in the showers. And, you know, we have a, a camp. I mean, it's not Dr. Bronick per se. We're, uh, uh, you know, Burning Man, we're not. Uh, it's actually my role as a board member of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. And we're, uh, just doing a lot to integrate psychedelic therapy and medicine. And, but on, uh, on the playa, Burning Man and other festivals, there's a project of MAPS called Zendo. It's a psychedelic harm reduction. It's like if you're having an overwhelming experience, rather than go to the med tent or some other not very good place to be when you're, you're, you're way out there. Like we have a very good kind of safe spot, like a Zendo it's called, and with, with sitters who can just really kind of help calm things down, get out of the kind of craziness. And, just kind of do some real good work. Oftentimes, like tough stuff's coming up, and people can do some real work and, and have a real positive outcome. Just they just need to take some space, and so that's our mission out there on, on Playa. But uh, what I did is uh, in 2009, I built a foam machine because my dad, when he died, it was just kind of overwhelming to be running both his business and Dr. Bronner's. So we just had to shut down the foam business. And, um, but I was just remembering like 10 years later, you know, I was like, you know, Pop, how did you do it? How did you raise a family and run a business? You know, I'm just going through a lot. And I was just remembering the joy that we brought the world with foam, just like blasting foam all over the place. We actually made a version for Hollywood at Fake Snow and would like, go to old folks' homes and daycares. And just, you know, it was just ecstatic. You know, people would just lose it, you know, when, you're, when you blast foam on the world. So I brought some foam, I brought a foam machine to, to Burning Man based on a late design. And, uh, and we were just clearing out blocks, like whole New York, what, you know, and there's like, you know, and so, so that, that just grew into now a <clears throat> really amazing camp uh, that, you know, we host maps and Zendo out there and see, where was I going with this? Uh, I was, uh, so we're, we're blasting foam. I mean, it's very ecstatic and fun and super, super ridiculous awesomeness. Yeah. Um, but there was a point here that I, I, I forgot what I was making. Well, I was, I was picking up your thread about in, after your father's passing and having the responsibility of two businesses and taking on so much with respect to regeneration, stewardship, sustainability. It's such, a, it's such an inspiration to see how you're keeping the, the joy and the frivolity and the, and, the, and the youthful kind of childlike playfulness in what you're doing. Um, and that was really kind of coming through uh, the the thread of the story that you're sharing with us. Oh yeah, I mean that you know my dad was just I mean that was just a big part of his personality it was you know in some ways he reacted against my dad. My dad, my dad wasn't the best dad. And, you know he was out saving the world and kind of kind of absent a lot. And um, you know my dad you know kind of compensated in in really making sure our family you know, he was just all in on our family and all in on the community and like it was all about you know, kind of, you know, rather than the cosmic vision, he was more like, what can you take care of right in front of you? And, uh, you know, it's really our, our central moral inspiration. You know, what's, what's pragmatic and practical kind of deal. And, uh, you know, I feel like really trying to honor both my granddad and my, you know, I really probably most of my family on the all one tip, you know, and that's the psychedelic integration is most kind of in that, that way it can just really open our hearts and minds to each other in the natural world and just help, uh, you know, uh, facilitate that experience of unity and oneness. Um, but also my dad and that, you know, like fair trade or gender organic, you know, like how, how can we actually make that, you know, like just really put in pragmatic ways, how do we leverage our business, and our, you know, what we're actually doing to, to really, you know, effectively, um, you know, drive change. But my dad was also just full of fun. I mean, he was just a fun guy. He so told the best funny stories and, 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 you know, soap and, and foam, it was just amazing. You know, we would just go around and just blast foam on the world. It was just the most awesome, fun thing ever. And my brother, so we had these six pillars. And I'm going to get myself into trouble because I'm going to forget them. But it's like, oh, I got them right here, a little cheat sheet. But here's our six pillars. So it's like, you know, how do we construct, you know, constructive capitalism? That's what we're all about. You know, we got, uh, let's see, so we got a, 
ourselves. That's like, you know, making sure we have a profitable business, our customers, you know, quality and all that. Um, our employees is making sure they're fairly compensated. And then our suppliers and our fair trade, which organic our supply chains and then our earth, like just, uh, you know, our just larger ecosystem and, and, uh, and, earth, and, and mother earth and making sure we're, you know, taking, doing things in harmony and then our community and, and leveraging our profits in a, in a cool way to just be helpful and, and power up allies doing awesome stuff. So my brother though, so here's a rad picture of my family. So here's a, so that's uh, me over there. And then my brother, Mike, he's company president and I'm the cosmic engagement officer. And that's my mom, Trudy, who's the CFO and my uh, brother-in-law, Michael, uh, is the CEO. And, uh, and that's actually our cosmic uh, fire truck that's in honor of my, of my dad. Um, so my, my brother though, it's like, he, he all of a sudden started going off the six principles and he says, well, you know, we got these six awesome principles, but I like to talk about the triangle. And I was like, what? You know, he just like all of a sudden dropped this one day in front of like everybody, our whole staff. I'm like, what triangle? And he's like, well, we got, you know, the soap, which is like the, you know, kind of business and taking care of business and make sure we're all efficient and stuff. And then we got the soul and that's like, you know, all the soulful stuff we're doing, but then joy. Like that's MFU, that's the fun. We gotta bring joy to the world. We gotta have fun. You know, if you're not having fun, then forget it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, right on, man. So, but yeah, I mean, that's totally a big part of what we're doing in our event marketing department. It's super fun. Another real fun thing we just did is make uh, Day of the Dead a holiday. Uh, so we have a mostly Mexican American workforce here in San Diego. And, uh, and we just, uh, for the first time, we had all international distribution partners in town. And uh, we had a Day of the Dead party, which I never did. And like our, our workforce, or a lot of our staff were just, it was amazing and, and Myrna is like this next level uh, cosmetic makeup artist and just made me look awesome I'm gonna show a picture here in front of my phone um, but uh, it was so much fun and, and but I went real took it real serious like hey this is a, you know you're honoring your ancestors you know and it was just really cool to check in with you know, my dad and granddad my uncle and I just really appreciate it went, what a beautiful holiday and then um, and then we're honoring our Mexican American workforce and you can celebrate Halloween correctly. It's like terrible yeah. that you can't like just totally go for it on Halloween because you got to go to work the next day. Yeah. So, so now, but, but we said you have to dress up for Halloween. It's not hundred percent participation on Halloween. There's the holidays canceled. <laughs> I love it. Good incentive structure. Yeah, totally. Uh, While you're looking for that picture, I'm going to just remind our audience, this is the why on earth communities stewardship and sustainability podcast series. And today we're visiting with David Bronner, the CEO of Dr. Bronner's that's cosmic engagement officer. And I want to give a quick shout out to uh, several of our sponsors who make this uh, episode possible. And that includes beauty counter, equal exchange, Purium, earth coast productions, Lidge Family Foundation, Patagonia, Waylay Waters, and the Association of Waldorf Schools of North America. A huge thanks to all of you for supporting our podcast series as well as our community mobilization work in towns and cities throughout the United States and North America for soil regeneration, climate action, and culture of kindness. And I also want to give a big shout out to all of our why on Earth community friends who have joined our monthly giving program, uh, which is another great way you can support this work that we're doing. And if you haven't yet joined it and you'd like to, you can go to whyonearth.org and click on the uh, donate button and just select any amount that would be uh, good for you to give on a monthly basis. And that really helps uh, sustain all of this work that we're doing. So a huge thanks to everybody for your support. While I'm at it, I want to shout out a handful of uh, the URLs and social media uh, resources for Dr. Bronner's, and that includes drbronner.com, and that's D R B R O N N E R.com. Twitter is Dr. Bronner, uh, Facebook is Dr. Bronner, and Instagram is Dr. Bronner. So it should be really easy for you to connect in with all this amazing work that David and his team and family are doing. And uh, we're going to dive in a little bit to some really important resources, especially at regenorganic.org. And uh, we'll hit on probably a couple of others as well. But um, there, there's some really important regenerative uh, soil stewardship and agriculture resources at regenorganic.org that I want to make sure to uh, 
bring your attention to. And uh, David, I, were you able to find that uh, picture you were looking yeah, at? Yeah, there we go. Let me see. The, oh my see. gosh. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's, yeah. that is that's uh, that is high quality makeup art right there. Yeah, Dave, wow. So that's too, super amazing. That sure is this next level. Um, so obviously we have to make that a holiday. Yeah, so, that's like, it was so fun. Uh, um, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, well, you know, it, it was great to hear, you know, Patagonia obviously is like a key partner in the regenerative organic space, but Equal Exchange, you know, they were the like, OG, like ins inspiration really for us to really get after our supply chains, you know, just really think about it, you know, along with Quiet Key. So I just want to shout out them. They're awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Big time. Yeah. What they're all doing is, is tremendous and remarkable. And I, you know, I, I want to give a shout out to what you guys are doing with some specific data here that I pulled from um, one of your most recent reports. It was either the 2019 or 2018 report where your CEO, uh, multiple on your median wage, your average wage is under five times. Whereas in most uh, corporate uh, United States corporate companies, we're seeing CEOs getting paid 312 times what the average workers are getting paid. Instead at Dr. Bronner's, it's under five times a difference. And, you know, there, there've been some tremendous um, trailblazers like the Mondragon cooperatives over there and, um, the Basque region of Spain over the last several decades, helping to implant the importance of not having such a massive pay differential as a way to sustain community. And you guys are also, uh, your starting permanent wage is over $18 an hour. And that's well beyond uh, what many communities are discussing in terms of a livable wage right now. And I just, I, I, it's tremendous. You guys have 122 million in sales and um, you're giving over 7% of, of that uh, to your charitable and sponsorship um, efforts. That's nearly $9 million uh, in, the, in the last year that I was looking at. And uh, David, I mean, that, that's the kind of leadership that I think um, deserves all kinds of accolades and shout outs. And, and for other corporate leaders, other entrepreneurs, other family businesses to start to really understand some of the details behind what makes a super successful, sustainably oriented, regenerative business like Dr. Bronner's. Yeah, right on. Thank you. Um, well, um, yeah, I mean, one, uh, you know, being inspired by by key allies, you know, just uh, being open to what, uh, you know, what can we do better? You know, what's the next best thing we can be getting after? Um, and uh, yeah, and then just being willing to uh, to get after it, I guess. Yeah, and, uh, you know, take some risks and uh, a, lot of, a lot of hard work. But um, I think what we found was, you know, we didn't have to raise prices too much to go organic and regenerate organic. Uh, you know, it's definitely a, there's a premium involved to take care of things correctly. You know, unfortunately, our the whole industrial agricultural machine is subsidized by you know these huge financial subsidies that do the exact worst thing to the to our ecosystems and the earth and um, you know we uh, basically externalize a lot of costs of, of uh, you know destroying our farmland and our soil and uh, and ecosystems and our health uh, yep. that's all externalized and not priced in the into our food we consume and you know products we buy so so there, there is a cost associated with you know going doing it the right way uh, versus you know products produced off of that conventional kind of chemical treadmill yeah but it, you know, it's not that much. And uh, in our case, what we, you know, we found, we first, we converted, I think, half our soap line. You know, we didn't want to just go all in on, you know, just, I mean, I was kind of ready to, but I think my brother had the right idea. Like, okay, let's just do, you know, let's just make sure that, um, you know, this is the, you know, our customers are ready to follow us on this journey. Yeah. And, you know, we were de definitely rewarded. We saw the, you know, increased sales with the, with the uh, you know, the organic uh, SKUs. And product line so then we went all in you know i think in 2003 um and uh yeah you know just making sure we do have a sustainable profit margin i mean there's been definitely times when that margins got real squeezed and you know we were squeaking by and just you know all kinds of stories of no cash and very little profit you know that you know just getting through just with a lot of luck on, on top of top of uh you know, everything else, but, you know, generally just making sure we've got sustainable margin, but not trying to, you know, but, you know, fair, keeping a good quality price. Um, 
And uh, yeah, you know, and just um, what we've found is that, you know, I don't, I don't think we set up out to do this, but that spending the, the amount of money that we do on activism, the causes we support, whether that's regenerative organic agriculture or income inequality and raising the minimum wage or GMO labeling or uh, uh, ending cannabis prohibition, that we get a lot of love, we get a lot of attention, we get a lot of, you know, earned media. So what uh, other companies would spend on a marketing budget, we're spending on, on activism, but we're kind of getting the same result. We're like getting a lot of, you know, awareness, brand awareness, but in a really cool way. Uh, and, and, you know, just kind of driving our top and bottom line um, in, uh, in, a, in a way that's like not uh, the orthodox approach, but is really effective and we're hoping that just, you know, and, and actually, you know, there are other companies that did it before us and after us. And, you know, we're just part of a, you know, an ecosystem of progressive businesses that like, really show in the rest of the world that like, look, you can really incorporate sustainable regenerative practices in your core business model and totally succeed. Um, and Patagonia, of course, is, you know, you know, exhibit A, you know, Von Chenard is just a huge inspiration. And, um, you know, we kind of feel like it's, that they're as aligned as could be. And, and we're really proud to be in partnership with them on the regenerative organic standard. Um, and that's basically bringing together the best of the soil health, animal welfare, and fair labor movements into a single certification. Yeah. So we don't have to have like separate animal welfare and separate soil health and separate fair fair trade. You can all you can have a one stop shop certification and, and really kind of taking the best of all of the uh, uh, criteria. And uh, you know, but we're just finishing up our pilot phase of the of the certification. And it's not just us in Patagonia, it's Rodale, it's Demeter, it's uh, uh, Fair World Project, it's Compassion World Farming, one of the leading farm animal welfare organizations, um, and then other, a lot of other really cool companies and, and farms. And, um, you know, we're ground truthing the standard, we're going to be, you know, getting all the feedback and, and making the adjustments and then launching it at Expo West you know, in March. So we're just on the verge of, you know, we, we feel like this is like an amazing consumer facing standard. Consumers can look for it and know that, you know, just everything they want to have happen in the product they buy is happening. Yeah. Um, so we're real excited. It's kind of like biodynamic without the, the, the mystical kind of preps and stuff. And I'm right. all about the moon and, and I love, but uh, I, you know, I, I love everything about biodynamic. And, and looking at the farm as an organism and the fertility and feed flows and just really understanding all that. But regenerative organics kind of that minus the, you know, more mystical side. So it's, um, you know, maybe a little more accessible to your average, uh, you know, conservative farmer. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, but we're big fans of biodynamics. Yeah, this is so exciting to hear about. And of course, Demeter, one of the partners in Regen Organic is a biodynamic certifying body and yeah. um, just amazing to see what's coming together here with this. And that's a, a major announcement and a major step that you guys are taking in, in March at Expo West. It's, it's tremendous. It's very interesting because we're through the Y and Earth community uh, networked increasingly with organic farms, regenerative farms, biodynamic farms all around the country and even internationally. And what I'm hearing and seeing is that even and especially in some of the conservative communities, like among fifth generation Mormon farmers um, in Utah, for example, working on five, 6,000 acre farms. The, the spiritual side of biodynamics is actually very approachable um, in those communities where prayer and uh, working uh, with a sense of divine presence um, is perhaps a little more natural or a muscle that's getting exercise a little bit more. And so it's, it's very dynamic right now, seeing in many of our more conservative uh, communities um, that biodynamics is actually being engaged and adopted um, in, in ways that often in our maybe more secular uh, communities, we, we don't see quite the same way. And so it's just beautiful to see all these different efforts and, and sort of the intelligence of all these different companies and organizations, much like a mycelial network in the soil itself, uh, really kind of optimizing and bringing forth the, the super intelligent strategies that we have to heal our world, to heal each other, and to, to really embrace this all one message that Dr. Bronner's has been sharing for, for so long now. Yeah, well, yeah, right on. And that's, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, and we, we, we're partners with Gabe Brown and 
uh, Ray Archuleta, and you know, definitely there's there's these you know very devout Christian farmers that are really leading the charge on regenerative agriculture, and really blazing the path. And uh, you know, we all totally respect that. And you know, I'm more on the all one path myself, but my mom and my you know sister and my brother are devout Christian, just complete respect for that path. And um, we're actually potentially going to be funding. Ray wants to produce a uh, kind of a regenerative ag. Uh, well, his dream is to do a feature link documentary, but uh, we're going to sponsor a shorter video. Um, to he really wants to make the case for regenerative ag to a Christian audience and put it in a Christian frame. Um, so that's something that hopefully he'll, he'll be doing next year. Yeah, I'm so excited to hear about this. We have a few friends and, and connections in the, uh, the the Midwest that I would love to um, weave into this conversation. We can obviously take that offline, but um, I'll, I'll drop a hint. There's an amazing evangelical preacher um, who is in Ohio doing all kinds of permaculture food forest work. His name is yeah. David Kunkler, and we'll be releasing his podcast episode sometime here quite soon. And I don't know if it'll be before or after the episode that we're doing with you, David, but um, he, he's really leading the way with a beautiful vision and a beautiful theology around taking care of this planet and being yeah. really good stewards of it. And um, the more we can help connect these dots, I think the, the more likely we are as a society to, to grow, to evolve, to heal uh, in a way that has us taking good care of our places and uh, good care of each other in, in our communities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'd love to make an introduction, although I bet they already know each other, but yeah. Yeah, this cool. is really fabulous. And I want to hear a little about what you're doing with Sun and Earth and, and the way you've been helping to lead the, the movement around hemp itself and, of course, some of the other um, natural uh, plants and uh, mushrooms and so on out there that you've been working with. And, Maybe you can tell us a bit about what's going on with Sun and Earth. Of course, you're, you're wearing the hat, so folks can see that if they're watching the video. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of our, our key causes here is, um, you know, ending cannabis prohibition and um, uh, integrating our psychedelic allies. Uh, I found for myself on my path that, um, you know, I don't, I'm not uh, any heroic user. I, 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 but just, a, just a little bit just really helps you put me in a, Kind of more meditative, prayerful mode, just more um, appreciative of um, you know my surroundings, my loved ones, and, and the natural world, and just puts me in touch and elevates me out of whatever stupid mood I might be in to, to just appreciate life and uh, and you know I really kind of feel that there's a sacrament, a sacramental dimension uh, that's really important in that society is like we need to kind of correct the. Um, uh, I don't know, I guess the, the, the cultural, uh, cultural schism that occurred in the 60s and, you know, all of these um, uh, sacraments were associated with the counterculture and rebellion, but we're starting to heal that up. And um, actually, one of, in, in MAPS, one of the biggest things we're doing with MDMA for uh, treatment resistant PTSD is like we're healing out veterans. And the veteran population is just, you know, it's just completely traumatized um, by, you know, these, these long wars and deployments and, so taking kind of a medicine of the counterculture to heal the, the wounds of the, of the soldiers, you know, I think it's a real sign of the times. We're starting to really heal the split. I mean, obviously there's still a lot of partisan stuff going on, but, you know, underneath the surface, I think there's a lot of real healing starting to happen and we're kind of moving through some stuff, like as a country, you know, hopefully. But anyway, so so cannabis, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's one of the safest medicines known to man. It's you know, we just need to understand, and respect plant medicines and indigenous medicines and ways of healing and knowing and being in the world. Like this is really crucial for like kind of what ails, I think, a lot of the Western um, disease. You know, like our you know, depression and anxiety and addiction. Like we're just disconnected from nature and from ourselves. And how do we heal that? It's really these medicines. Like this, this is like the healing that we need. We need to bring them in as fast as possible, and really help reconnect us to ourselves and to our deeper natures and nature in general. Um, you know, wake up to pretty much all of, of the social and environmental issues that we need to be grappling with. And um, 
so it's an important mission. So, but ending cannabis prohibition and, and you know just stopping this kind of disaster of mass incarceration over a very safe and beneficial plant. Um, what we realized is, you know, we we kind of thought like, oh wow, you know, cannabis is about consciousness, and you know that somehow industry and corporate corporation will be different or something. Mm-hmm. Anyways, by like 2014, 16, we realized that. Uh, that cannabis is pretty much just another flower that's being commoditized and just in a horrible way that corporate industrial interests do to every other commodity crop. And we're seeing these huge indoor grows that are, you know, light, you know, under artificial light, very fossil fuel intensive, pesticide intensive, synthetic fruit fertility. And that the small family craft farmers, many of which are back to the land, organic pioneers, you know, they're you know, multi-generational, their parents, you know, went back to land and they're growing, you know, vegetables and you know, all kinds of stuff, raising chickens, you know, and they got, you know, some, some cannabis plants over there, you know, but it's an integrated, you know, like multi-crop, you know, beautiful permaculture uh, uh, farm. And, you know, how do, you know, these farms are not, are just being completely destroyed. Like, just it's the same story that you see with every, crop, you know, like what we're seeing with coconut oil, you know, and so our coconut project is, in Sri Lanka, it grew out of a tsunami relief project. And, um, you know, it's the same story around the world. You know, just huge corporate plantations come in and it's displaced like vibrant farming communities and, you know, force them off their land and they become, you know, farm workers for slave wages on, 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 on plantations. You know, like how do we keep small farmers on their land so they can really take care of it? You know, regenerative organic is a management intensive. It's, it's knowledge intensive. It's not chemical intensive. You know, it, it lends itself to smaller, more productive farms, you know, and how do, how do we promote that? And so around like each of our raw materials has a really good story. So our coconut oil comes out of Sri Lanka and it's like a thousand farmers doing regenerative organic practices or palm oil, we were talking about that in Ghana, it's all awesome things. And now we're producing a whole bunch of cocoa that, you know, we're looking at launching a chocolate uh, product, uh, oh, product line, nice. really tell the story of dynamic ag forestry. Our olive oil comes from Palestinian farmers in the West Bank primarily, but then the balance from the Israeli side, from a Jewish family farm and an Arab Christian project. So we got Muslim, Christian, Jewish, olive oil in our soap, but it's all regenerative and next level. And so, uh, you know, what we're seeing with, with, with cannabis is that because of federal prohibition, a cannabis farmer can't access the USDA organic program because organic is federally regulated and even regenerative organic because of the term organic, cannabis farms cannot access the regenerative organic program so you know we saw this crucial need for consumer facing certification standard that you know someone can trust that their medicine was produced uh you know in the righteous way like it's in the soil it's under the sun no chemicals fair labor um and so sun and earth was what we came it's kind of a parallel effort to regenerate organic mm. to be clear like Patagonia is not involved in this they're not ready to you know be in this space you know they're they totally respect what we're doing but we're over here working just with some next level farms and, and companies in the cannabis space to kind of build out a consumer facing stamp, a certification that kind of replicates regenerative organic in the cannabis space. Um, so we're starting to see some real traction. Uh, so, you know, it's just been launched in this past year, actually in April. So, uh, you know, we're, you know, next year we're really excited to see some of the really good traction. Um, you know, it's a brand neutral. We don't. We want to see all kinds of farms and brands certified with it, and um, just you know, we feel like cannabis is going to be you know as big or bigger than beer and wine. Yeah, um, this is really important. You know, biodynamics got a huge amount of traction in wine, and we feel like Southern Earth can get you know a lot of traction in cannabis. And, yeah, you know, kind of replicate that wine model. That's really beautiful. Well, I love how all that you're doing is coming back to how. Uh, we're caring for people and also specifically how we're caring for for soil so i I love the name sun and earth right it really embodies that yeah absolutely and you know especially in cannabis too because it's like so much of it is artificial lights indoor you know and like so sun you know like it's natural it's under the sun and earth you know in the soil because a lot of it's like even if it's outside if they're in bags or in you know greenhouse or something you know in the soil you know this cannabis should be farmed like you know in regenerative organic way that's in the soil you know, under the sun so. i imagine that someday our science will be able to understand and observe differences in the quality of, of the medicine and the quality of these plants 
based on whether they're grown in real soil with real sunlight or not. And uh, yeah. I don't know if we're there yet, but um, it seems that there's a qualitative difference. Uh, you know, I think so. I think it's, you know, vibrationally, you know, definitely way better. And um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, whatever's in the soil is going to be in the flower. Mm -hmm. So if you're using a bunch of pesticides and a bunch of whatever, you know, that's, you know, just like food, that's what you're getting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and conversely, you're getting just nutrient density, all kinds of micronutrients and soil terrar in a, in, a, in a cannabis flower that's farmed in the soil versus in a chemical kind of, I don't know what medium. So yeah, exactly. Well, this is just just tremendous. Uh, everything that that you and your family and your team are doing, David. And um, I know I know it's a very busy time. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the Wyoners Community Network for taking the time to visit with us. And uh, before we sign off, is there anything else that you'd like to mention or or to share with our audience? Um. Well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, thank you for having me and, and just been a pleasure and, and, and thank you for doing all the awesome things you're doing. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's great to hear the, the community and, and, and uh, awareness you're building uh, around these issues. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're, we're involved in Oregon in the psilocybin therapy campaign. So I just got back there. I was up there yesterday. Yeah. Um, so we feel that's just really important to, bring into the culture like th these are very powerful medicines and not to be uh, approached lightly, you know, respectfully and ideally properly prepared for facilitated and integrated. Um, they really optimize their, their, their power that they have to help heal us and open us up in a really great way. Um, and so the therapeutic context is, you know, you, you have a, someone who's can really facilitate a, a real good experience is trained and can trust. Um, you know, rather than just kind of decriminalize and launch them into the culture without that kind of container, you know, because you look at indigenous traditions like around ayahuasca, um, you know, there's, you know, ceremonial containers, you don't, you don't take these psychedelics outside of that. And uh, so, so what we feel like what Oregon's doing is really important. Uh, side 2020, side-2020.org is the uh, website on that one. Um, SunonEarth.org is the Sun and Earth one. Uh, that's psi-2020.org. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll put that in the show notes too. Right on. Thank you. And yeah, I think that I think we hit it all, man. Cool. Well, what, what a joy to have this time with you, David. And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing. And uh, thanks so much for uh, visiting with us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Right on. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Have a great night. You too. Yeah. Ma'am. Bye. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code WhyOnEarth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.